Hi, I'm Nick Speed, and today I'm gonna to give you a masterclass on how to target margin carp. Well, you've joined me today at the beautiful Hawcroft Fisheries, and I've many, many years at this place, ever since it was actually opened in the 1990s. So, the interesting thing is, it actually holds fish that are very old now, and fish of all sizes, different strains of fish, but it's so well renowned this venue for holding big margin carp and I thought this is the perfect place for actually demonstrating how to catch these big fish down the edge. The bigger they get the cleverer they are and this is exactly why I wanted to come here to demonstrate how I target big clever fish. It's not just about how you feed your peg, what rigs you use, it's using the watercraft. The watercraft is so important and a stealth thinking as well. So let me take you to my peg and I'll show you exactly what I'm doing from a bait preparation to my rigs, my thought process, and hopefully catch a few fish along the way. So let's talk about bait. How many videos are there out there about bait? But I can't stress how actually important it is. Not necessarily the products are really, really important, but keeping things simple, logical. So let's have a look at the actual weather and the conditions that we're faced with today. Back end of the summertime now, but the water's still got an algae bloom. So to me, the colour of your ground bait is really important. I want to marry the colour of my ground bait to the colour of the water as a camouflage. When it comes to margin fishing and feeding, I don't often think, I don't, I don't think it's about the food. I think it's about the cover. And that's exactly what you get from ground bait. As long as you find that right depth of water down the edge, feeding ground bait down the margins is about making the fish feel safe, especially with what we're after today, which are big, wise, old fish. If we've got that cloud in that water, you're gonna graze over the particles on the bottom a lot more confidently. So let's talk about the bait that I've got in front of me. Let's talk about the ground bait first, and then we'll go on to the hook bait choice. So for a start, we've got <coughs> the Dynamite Margin Mix. Now the Dynamite Margin Mix is a phenomenal ground bait that we've developed specifically for margin fishing. So it's a heavy, dense mixer. But I like to add a few little twists with my ground bait as with all styles of my fishing, and I'm sure a lot of you out there are the same, that you just don't want to use one bag. You want to tailor it to you as an angler which you're confident with. So today I'm going to be using my margin mix as my bulk. I'm also going to be adding green swim stim. Now without a doubt, I t even naturals, I can't think of going anywhere without actually taking a bag of this with me. I absolutely love the stuff. And of course that's going to marry the colour of my ground bait then with the colour of the water and algae green. And also what I want to do is only a little bit but it's amazing what a small amount does is just add a small amount of black swim stim just to darken that mix off a little bit. So that is the mix and also how I mix it up. I'm quite simple on the bank. I don't want to be on the bank using a power drill. I want to do things nice and quietly. I'm a massive believer in vibration. Carp are very susceptible to vibration. I don't want to mix them a ground bait with power drill and I like to overwet my mix, so it's so easy to do. I can't see the point in using a power drill at all. On a natural venue, yes, but when it comes to this style of fishing, definitely not. So let's get going. So first of all, I'm gonna add, it smells lovely that. I could eat it, maybe after I've mixed it. I'm gonna add half a bag. Now what you've gotta be, you've gotta be think about is, be positive when you're fishing for margin fish. A small amount of bait isn't enough volume of bait to attract and get the fish competing. You don't just want fish in your peg. You want, a, you want one fish at a time in your swim if you fish in the right depth of water, but you want a few fish hanging back. And in order to create that competition for them to move up the shelf or move along the shallow length of the water into that shallow margin, you've got to create a volume, set a trap. You've got to create a volume of bait to give them a reason to come down the margins. The only reason why they're down the margins is looking for food. So that's what you've got to think. So nearly two thirds of a bag of margin mix. 
a third of a bag of green swim stim to darken it off as I've said and a very small amount of black swim sim to darken it off even a little bit more only a, literally 250 mil there very small amount I'm going to mix it with my hand now and like I said at, at the start to me targeting these kind of fish it's all about stealth it's not about making lots of noise being quiet just think about nature what you know any part of nature wants to move away from human human movement and the quieter you are the quicker that will happen where they'll come in and feel safe so i've mixed that up roughly and what i want to do now is really over wet the mix because i want all those particles to absorb the moisture so you can see it's swimming in water and it ends up being a really nice stodgy mix so that's ensuring whilst I get my rig ready I plumb it up I get all my tackle sorted all those particles are absorbing that moisture so it becomes what we call an inert mix it will dry out and then that allows me to add more water if I need to depending on how I want to feed my peg but that's something I'm going to talk to uh, talk to you about whilst I'm fishing and during that progression of feeding my peg and understanding how the fish want to be fed as opposed to how we want to feed them I will adjust the consistency of my ground bait so that is ready for resting and that's how easy it is you don't need a power drill just use a bit of stealth on the bank side and trust me it'll make a massive difference especially if you're mixing your ground bait on your platform can you can you imagine how much vibration that's creating through your peg through the water and it's pushing fish away from you so think about things like that so that's the ground bait out of the way so let's talk about the hook baits now there are certain hook baits that blend with venues and without a doubt Hawcroft is a venue that marries so well with dendrobinas these are willy worms dendras very uniform nice and big two of these dendras on a 12 hook are absolutely perfect and the reason why worm works really well here is because it's got a large head of perch um, and silvers as well and what I love about the worm is it tells you when the carp are there you'll usually know when the carp are there because you won't catch perch um, now there are other baits such as sweet corn and maggots and maggots are such an effective way when you've got a lot of fish in your peg and they're feeding very confidently it allows you to lift and drop your rig if you've missed a bite put your rig in your bait's still presenting exactly the same way on your hook um, and you can lower your rig back in and literally have a chance of catching that same fish that you've missed a bite from you get exactly the same principle from worm but i don't think you get that principle with corn but i love corn because of the weight of it nice heavy bait so this is a bait that i like to use when there's a wind on there's water movement it could create a little bit of a uh, hindrance with your presentation any other bait but sweet corn is nice and heavy and that's why I like it what is important is how you hook it on but I'll show you that on the bank side and that means by hooking it on the right way you can get away with quite a big hook because at the end of the day we're fishing for big fish here you've got to think positive so positive bait simple choices as well not over complicating things and I can virtually guarantee I must completely contradict myself here but I virtually guarantee that worm is going to be the strongest bait today. Uh, so that is the bait I'm confident with. That's the bait I'm going to focus on. But like I said earlier, it's about using the right bait for how the fish want to be caught rather than how you want to catch them. So for all I know, it could be a sweet corn day today. And this is why you need these options. So that's the bait, nice and simple, but very effective at the same time. So let's finish off where we started regarding the ground bait uh, 10 minutes have gone by I've riddled it and there you have it's amazing how fluffy it becomes now the interesting thing is as long as you rest your ground bait long enough something as stodgy and claggy as what that mix was becomes a really nice soft fluffy mix a the riddling is really important do it from a height get that air into that mix it really does transform the texture and the consistency of your ground bait. So now I've got what I call a manageable mix. 
squeeze it nice and hard, nice balls, but a true a key point to always remember with your ground bait is if you can squeeze it really rock hard and then it breaks down to its original form, you've got a manageable ground bait. That allows you to mix a little bit more water to it or do whatever you want to do with it and tailor it to how the fish want to be fed at that particular time. So that's the ground bait. And as I said as well, quite a nice dark mix, not too bright, blends lovely with the colour of the water. So that's that. Now, before I go on to feeding peg, let's talk about the rig. And like I said earlier, a lot of the hook bait choices what I've chosen today are dictated by the depth that I'm fishing in. Now, I'd say the average depth at Hawcroft is just under two foot. In my opinion, especially for big fart carp, it's not about finding that really shallow water, it's about finding that optimum depth. And I always go from my fingertips, uh, from my elbow to my fingertips as a guideline. I wanna try and find that depth for big carp, not too deep, not too shallow. So if we just measure that up there, it's maybe about two inches too deep. Just put that there like that. About two inches too deep for the perfect depth, but I'm really happy with the depth, to be honest with you. And the reason behind that, I'll talk about the rig in a sec, but the depth is the most critical part of this conversation. Carp are very clever. You know, if the peg's too shallow, they're so moody and reluctant to feed in that shallow depth, Whereas if it's the right depth, often you won't even see them because they're confident in feeding. And that's what I want to look for. I don't want boils in my peg. I don't want tails in my peg. I want them coming in and out of my peg nice and happy. And by finding the right depth such as that, which is two and a quarter foot, um, that's a happy depth to me. And that is the optimum depth at Hawcroft, I'd say. 18 inches uh, to two and a half foot is the depth you're looking for, but ideally around two foot. So let's talk about the rig. Um, oh, before we do, let's just talk about the hook baits, what blends with this depth. And this is why worms are really good, corn's are really good, heavy baits. Always remember that. The deeper your margin, the heavier your bait wants to be within reason. So if you're gonna use soft baits such as sweet corn, maggots, worms, I'd always opt for a heavy bait such as worm or corn for that reason, to create that stability, that good presentation, uh, to ensure that when you get a bite, it's a clean bite, it's a proper bite, it's a fish in the mouth and it's not a foul look fish. So let's talk about the rig. Now this is a Malman Adam, 4x14, quite a nice heavy rig. I'm using Shimano Aero Slick Silk as a main line, 021 to an 019 up length. Now there was a time I always used to fish straight through, but it's not efficient enough. And what I mean by that is if your hook goes blunt, you have any problems, especially when you're fishing a critical length line between the pole tip and the flow. Um, not in this case, I, I, and I'll go into that in another, like a bit, in a bit. Um, it, just, it just makes your fishing inefficient if you're having to put a fresh hook length on. But when it comes to durability, straight through is unbeatable. But nowadays I use an hook length. So we've got 021 main line to an 019 hook length. Now, here I like to use quite a long hook length because the fish are very cute. And I've always found that if you use, let's say, a two or three inch hook length, they can feel that weight. They can feel that resistance. So I want to create a little bit of suppleness between my bulk and my hook bait. I'm not necessarily going to be laying that line on the bottom. I might only be laying an inch on the bottom. I've plummeted up, so my flow is that out of the water. So I've got some kind of stability with my hook bait, regardless of whether it's double corn, single corn, double worm, bunches of maggots. I've got some stability with my rig, and that's in case the wind picks up or fish movement. But let's talk about the shot, actually, because I've always been a big believer for all my shallow fishing, I use stocks, and for margin fishing, I use stocks, but big, big carp, I always want to use shot. And what I've found with stocks is throughout the duration of a five hour period, they move up and down your line too much because they're very soft material. I want something a little bit more secure that's gonna lock in place and that's exactly what, what you get with shot. But the key thing is with shot, always put your shot on at home with a pair of pliers to ensure that they're nice, synchronized, in line, nice and neat. They don't damage the line as long as you put them in the area, slide all the shot up by wetting the line so it's not burning the line. Take your time, make that rig 
as secure as you possibly can because we are fishing for big fish today. You want a no-nonsense rig that's not going to let you down. And in your head, you want to be completely confident that that is exactly what's going to happen, that you're going to hook that fish and you're going to land it. So that's why I like to use shot now. And as well as that, if there is a time where maybe the peg was a little bit deeper and I wanted to disperse the weight of the rig, it's not about creating a slower fall of bait, it's about dispersing the weight of the rig by just spreading that shot out a bit and doing a, a spread shot really does minimize the resistance on your hook bait. So if my peg was a little bit deeper, I would definitely start by just spreading that shot out a little bit. So it's like a shirt button shotting pattern. Not massive, but just spreading out a little bit massively reduces the resistance within the rig. And then that allows you to get away with a heavy rig. And that's why I'm using a nice four by 14. Two mil bristle, that's really, really important as well. Nice thick flow, so you can read the difference between false indications and proper bites. And when I've shotted it up, I've shotted it up, so I've not got too much out of the water, but I don't want it dotted down like that. I want to read the indications. Nice, strong, durable flow. And above the flow, I have got four number eight stots. Now, of course, I'm using stots as my back shot because that allows me, even with four of them bolted together, look how easy it is for me to move them up and down and adjust without damaging the line. And as I've said earlier, I've got quite a long length of line. We're fishing for big carp here. Very, very clever, cute fish. They've seen it all before. They've been around a long time. And we, uh, if you get your presentation right, you're giving yourself that chance of targeting those bigger fish that are coming into your swim. And what I want to do is I want to put my rig in and then I want to pull my pole to the left hand side. So it's completely out of the way and it looks like just a bit of foliage on the bank side. If your line's too short, then you get pole movement. And I'm convinced that makes a massive difference with carp. So it's time to feed my peg uh, and let's see what happens. Well, actually, I've had a little bit of a telling off because I've actually forgot to talk about two major parts of my setup. Um, which is the hook and the elastic. Now, let's talk about the elastic. That is the business end. I'm a no-nonsense angler, especially with big fish. Let's say, for example, it comes to the last few minutes of the match, the mar mar fish are down the margins, you've only got five minutes, you know you need that extra fish. It's so important that you use the right setup. So I'm using MIDI Reactor Core. I absolutely love this stuff. It's a real animal elastic. And because it blends perfectly with the diameter of the line that I'm using, I can play those fish with confidence. It's not a case of hooking the fish, letting the fish swim out. It's hook the fish, pull behind you, break down, and pull that elastic out and land that fish as quickly as you can. Because if you can manage to get two of them fish in that last five minutes, that is a match-winning approach. That's a match-winning frame of mind. Make the most of those crucial minutes, even if it is the last few minutes, it'll massively increase your overall weight at the end of the day. So that then blends with what hook I'm using. I'm using a Tubitini 175. Look, there's loads of margin hooks on the market, but for me as an angler, I just love them. I've used them for years. They're strong, nice wide gate, blend perfectly with the baits I've already mentioned. It's a real confidence hook. And I'd say it's like a, that's a number four, which is like a 12, uh, which as I say, blends with double worm, double corn, bunches of maggots. Just love them. Confidence is a massive thing when you're margin fishing. So let's feed the peg. Right, so let's talk about feeding the peg. Now, what you've got to remember is I am pleasure fishing today. This isn't a match. So, of course, all I've set up is one rig. Now, let's say, for example, I am in a match and I want to feed my margins because it feels like the right time of the day, not necessarily an hour into the match. It could be the last hour, and this is a crucial thing. I want to feed my peg, but then give it maybe five minutes before I go on it. And if I don't get a response, then I'd feed my peg again. Try an instant response over the top of it. And then if it doesn't work, then I'd be doing something else and resting that bait, giving those fish that confidence and safety without any disturbance of my rig being in the water, of them coming over my bait and settling. Whereas today I'm actually plundering it. So it's really important to make the most of the right time of the day. So let's say for example, it's come to the killing time of the day where I know my margins could work. I'm gonna feed 
four big pots of ground bait. Now, the interesting thing is, if you look at the weather, we've got the wind coming down here, everything feels right for the fish to come down and feed confidently down the margins. So I don't think I have to feed a massive volume of bait to get them there. We've seen them just cruising around within meters of the bank. Whereas let's say, for example, the wind was off the back, the fish would be further out, they'd be a little bit more moody, a little bit scared of coming down that margin. So then that their days where it's gonna work later on in the day, even like what I said earlier, the last five, 10, look, there's one there over my bait straight away. Five, 10 minutes earlier, um, at five, 10 minutes into, uh, before the end of the match, the wind direction makes a massive difference and dictates how the fish feed and how quickly they come down the edge. So I've put one in, but I've seen a fish there. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna change what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna put two pots out because there's one on it straight away, which is a great sign. And I tell you what, not forgetting, it's two and a quarter foot down there. That must have been a good fish, that. So two pots of bait, that's all I want. And I've wet, wetted the mix up quite wet. Look, boil again, they're on it straight away. Wait for this. Um, so I've wetted the mix up quite wet. I've pushed it into the pot, the old sandcastle trick that I used to do years ago. So I'm really confident that I'm going to get a fish straight away. So let's go in with a positive bait worm. And what I'm actually going to do before I go on with this. I'm actually going to put another pot out because I've got a feeling that over that bait so quickly it's disturbed the bait and spread it around. So double worm. First intention, slap the worm on the surface. Actually one of them, let me just do that again. Put a smaller one on. You just have to make sure you hook the worms properly otherwise Now what I want to do is I want to slap the worm just to knock them out. Give them another pot. You can tell what I said that they're on the bait instantly because everything's right. The wind's down here. The fish are cruising near the bank in. So they're on that bait instantly. But what I don't want to do, unless it's absolutely solid, is put an actual big pot on the pole tip feed a nugget and drop my rig instantly over the top of it because these fish are very, very clever. Very spooky fish. There we go. Another ball of ground bait. Now by pushing it in and creating a sandcastle, what you're doing is, it's still air caught within the ball, it's falling down and then it explodes as it descends to the bottom. So you're creating a tighter feeding column. Now what I want to do is just double check Everything's intact, which it is, with my rig, before I put it out. Now, as I'm putting my rig out, I don't want to bring my rig on the outskirts. All them fish are here on the outskirts, so I want to drag my bait along the bank to my marker, not pull my pole out and, and drag it in, because you can often spook the fish that are hanging around on the outskirts of your bait. So I've got it in the spot. Now, what I've got to do is make sure I wait for the right bait, uh, bite. Now, it's actually quite hard for me to drag my pole any nearer the bank than what I am. But you can see with how that float is, that allows me to read a proper bite. Now, what I do like to see is no indications what I don't want is, especially when you think there's a carp there, putting your rigging and getting all little dips and daps, little taps off silverfish. But actually, if you put your rigging and nothing happens, that's a really good sign because that shows there are carp in the area. So the silvers haven't got that opportunity to take your bait or get into that feeding zone. So I'd rather sit there not getting any indications and all of a sudden out at blue getting a nice clean bite. Now, with a lot of big fish on these commercials, it's not a case about lifting your rig up and down, tantalizing them to take your hook bait. Because I could guarantee 
if I lifted, I'm being uncomfortable here actually, let me just get settled, that's it. If I lifted this rig up to try and tempt a carp, I would spook it out on the peg. So once you've placed that rig in, always think of that stealth frame of mind. Keep that bait stable on the bottom, secure and natural. One thing you don't want to be doing is lifting and dropping your hook bait, because I can guarantee with these big fish, they'll be straight out of your peg. And you'll see them when you lift your rig out, they'll just spook out of that way. But like I said, it's a really good sign that I've put my rig in and I've not had a sign. The interesting thing is, like what I said, this is why I don't like to use a pole pot on the end of my rig, because they are so clever. We put the bait in, they were on it straight away, but it's amazing how you swim and your peg changes once your actual rig goes into the water. Now you've got line going straight down the centre of your pet in your swim, where the bait is, and these carp, they are so clever. And little things like length of line between your pole tip and your float is so important because I'm trying to push that pole tip as far to the bank as possible to make it there, but there's one in my peg now. I've just seen a bit of a vortex at the back. Now it's not actually see it there, you're just moving out of my peg now. Still got my eye on my float, but I can see that fish. So it's been in, it's mostly started eating on the particles that are maybe half a metre past my pole tip going towards the cameraman. They're so, so clever. And I can guarantee to you, I'll, if I don't get a bite, I will lift my rig out, come back, put another pot of ground bait in, and they'll be on it straight away. And what happens is it's progression, time and motion. Gradually, they just get used to it. And of course, oh, that was an indication, but it, weren't, it wasn't a proper bite that. It wasn't fast enough. I'm gonna give it another minute and then I'm gonna feed my peg again. You can't spend too long waiting for a bite with these fish. If you don't get a bite within four or five minutes of your feeding, you've got to repeat the process. And like I said, time and motion plays a big part with this theory that eventually, more fish will start coming in. And as soon as rather than just one or two start coming in, there's a few more there, few more there wanting to come in, that's when they feed confidently. That's when your bites are cleaner, your bites are quicker, everything starts working. And that's a lot to do with the wind direction, the time of the day. You have to just go through the motions and eventually everything clicks into place and your peg kicks off. Well, although we didn't manage to capture the bite, I've finally got my first fish and it's quite interesting this, the wind's died and actually changed direction a little bit. And like I said earlier, time and motion, keep feeding, keep going through the motion. You could instantly see when the carp arrived because I went from getting the odd indication off roach and perch and everything in the peg that you don't really want to catch to all of a sudden silence. And I've hooked my first proper fish and you can tell down here that it's the bigger fish that are feeding. You can see them moving around on the outer perimeter of where my bait's going, but reluctant to actually come over the bait. So it's time and motion. And again, this is a beaut about using a nice, confident setup. You can bring your pole straight back. And this is, I tell you what, this is what makes it all worthwhile. And it's amazing, once you hook that first fish, how your peg changes. And what I mean by that is, as I'm playing this fish now, the other carp will be mooching around over the bait and in turn that's going to deter the small fish from settling over the feed. Coming to the killing time of the day now where this approach I just want to get his head up first every time he's come up twice now but 
these are big fish. So I've got to ensure that I get its head in the net first. It's always the commons that seem to fight the hardest as well. Real powerhouses these are. It's always the commons that These are the ones you want. <clears throat> now look at that for a fish. That is a big fish, that. Not 20, but I'd say 16, 16, 17 pound possibly, but beautiful condition, which goes to show they don't get caught often. And that's because they know exactly when to come down the edge and feed. Very, very clever fish. And hopefully if it behaves, are you going to behave, mate? I don't want to... That is what it's all about. Look at that. That is a beauty. I don't want to lift it too much. We treat these fish with the utmost respect. Slip them in the net. And let's repeat the process and hopefully catch his granddad. So again, a lot of people might get giddy and put the rig straight back out. It's really important that you keep repeating that process and creating what we call a focal point in your peg. So, a bit of ground bait. Nothing in my bait apart from ground bait because I really want my hook bait to be a target bait. Minimal choice, forcing them in a way to take my hook bait quicker. And this is, this is like what I said when I was playing that fish, this is where my peg's going to change. So, pot of ground bait, nothing in it. And sometimes, if you feel that you need to add a few particles, let's say I call that on a, on a single grain of corn, sometimes it's just good sometimes to look on it straight away to help the fish accustom themselves to what you're fishing on the hook. So yeah, sometimes it is good to add the odd particle, but I try not to. I'm trying to force them onto my hook bait as quickly as possible. And also, I'm just looking for the right size grain to blend with my hook. I'm not picking any size out. I'm picking a particular size that blends with the hook. Single grain of corn. I did start on a double, but it just didn't seem right. Maybe it's because there weren't enough fish there. And definitely, worm's not the right bait today at this moment in time because there's been too many silvers mooching down the edge. So make sure my rig's in line where my bait is, hold the rig straight, lower it down, pole to the left. And this is where, like I said before, no movement on that flow, no mo minimal movement on the pole. And we're not looking for instant bites. You know, I could get a bite now, or I could get a bite in three, four, five, six minutes, but I need to keep that rig still. So if a big carp comes in, like the size of that one that I've caught, they're not stupid. And I'm trying to get my float as tight to the bank as I can. So I'm kind of like on the perimeter of where my bait's gone in. So my ground bait is moving down the shelf beyond my float. If I wanted to, let's say, get a bit giddy and put my rig where my bait's gone in, it's just going to induce false indications. And you can see there's a carp there because the water movement has pushed my rig towards the bank. And this is a view of that back shot as well. So I'm replacing my rig. That's, see that there? Just see that's gone over the back of a fish. That, and this is why it's so important to not move your rig if you can help it. But I had to move that. And again, 
so they're moving on it straight away so i've got a feed again a lot of people would try and put the rig in again but you can imagine now two big carp have come into that peg within seconds and all that ground bait has been pushed away from where my float is so i'm now what i'm going to do is i'm going to wet my ground bait even more i want to create my ground bait as heavy as possible i'm not putting a full pot out but i am going to press it in because i want it to clump together so it creates a tighter column and now they're coming onto it. Like I said, it's the killing time. This is crucial that you feed. Like that. You've got your bait on already. And you're shipping straight back out. What you don't want to be doing is feeding and messing about putting your hook bait on. Everything needs to be ready. So I'd imagine that the cart will be on that very straight, straight away. But again, I've got to pick the right bite. I've got to wait until it's a positive bite, mimicking a big carp sucking in a grain of corn. Now, just in my eye line, I've just seen a carp swirl next to the foliage on, that's laying on the water, maybe about two meters beyond my pole tip. So you can see that they're really getting interested now. And this style of fishing, especially for these wise fish, it's like a flick of a switch from you thinking, and the one's just moved out of my peg now, that there's nothing there. And then all of a sudden your float goes under your hook one and it changes your frame of mind and your peg. Ideally, if there was a wind on, a ripple, some cover, some water movement, this peg would be working a lot quicker, but because it's bright, sunny, flat, calm, I have to purely rely upon the time of the day for them to feed down the edge. And it's all these little things like what I've explained that's crucial to put to use really and make the most of that killing time when they do come down the edge. Big fish, big weight builders as well. You know, you can imagine that two of those fish in the last 20 minutes I could double the weight of your the rest of the match period so to speak now you can see that my float has just moved a little bit to the left but I'm going to keep it there because I made that mistake of lifting my rig out before and it spooked a fish. Now you could tell that was a silverfish bite because if that was a carp bite, A, I'd have hooked it, or a better chance of hooking it, but also I didn't spook anything out of the peg. And you can see the silvers are back now. I say you have to just keep repeating that process. If all of a sudden you lose hope in it, yeah, you can rest your peg. That's really important to rest your peg. But if you feel it's the right time of the day, you have to keep repeating that process and going through the motions. And all of a sudden, all the theories, what I've explained, slot into place and it works and you get a bite and you catch a fish and you catch another and it changes your frame of mind. And before you know it, you've forgotten about your other approaches. And this is how matches are won. Even if, like what I say, it's the closing minutes of the match, this is how you win matches. Especially with the size of the fish that are in here. I mean, they are massive. And it wouldn't surprise me today if I caught a 20 pounder. But you have to make sure everything's right for these fish. Seen it all before, and they are very, very clever. there's one in my peg now but these fins on these fish are so big 
where that boil is, is definitely not where the head of the fish is. So ideally what I want to look for is actually boils maybe half a metre away from where my float is. And that's telling me that that's where the head is. And it's really important for this reason to pick the right depth of water, to read what you, what's happening with your swim. Well, as expected, the so-called closing minutes of the day or the session and everything's starting to work now. I've not actually seen this, but it feels a nice fish. Not a big one, but still worth catching. Nice mirror carp. And it's definitely at this point where I've got a feeling I'm going to drop back in and get another one. But I've still got to repeat the process. Even if there's a few minutes remaining You've got to give the fish a reason to come to your hook bait. So again, not a full pot of ground, mate, just half a pot. Quite wetted down now. Hook bait's already on. This is the time of the day where the fish are on the bait instantly. But it's been a very weird day, a very moody day. Maybe that's because of the, the lack of wind. I don't know, but they are old fish and this is a, a very tough area of the lake that this is why I wanted to fish here. Simply because we're selecting the big fish in the lake. We could have gone somewhere else on the lake and caught loads more carp. But if you want to target the big carp, this is definitely the area to be in the bowl of the moat pool. And uh, they're just so clever. It's happened for quite a period of time now, killing time of the day where you think the float's going to be going under every single chuck. But they're so reluctant to actually settle and feed. And like I said earlier, all of a sudden, flick of a switch, time of day, lights dropping, it's time to feed. And they move in. And all of a sudden, from getting silverfish bites, I'm not getting any indications or whatever, which to me is a really, really good sign. So let's see if we can get another one. Hopefully a big one, big 20 pounder. You just see them, it's just, they're not coming straight to the bait now. When I'm saying that, there's one there now. And this is a, it's like a high air pressure day today. Considering we're at the back end of the summer period it's a really, really warm day today and it's evident to see that unfortunately I can't get into that shallow enough water. Like what I said earlier, two, three inches shallower would have been good, but actually looking at the what's happened today, I'd have liked it to have been six inches shallower because that seems to be the depth what the fish are swimming into the peg at. However, at a certain part of the day, regardless of the depth, the fish are there and they want to feed. So, I've got to be on it now. Make the most of the last few moments of the session and see what we can uh, muster together. There we go, lovely beautiful bite 
beautiful bite. But how big is it? Now to me, I don't want to mess about with it. A, because I want to get it in quickly. Keep the pole low. And this is about a bit beauty about this elastic. It's a real power elastic. Not a massive fish. But a good weight builder. So the question is, do I feed or do I go back out? Well, I'm always a feeder. If I've got time, I will always feed. So, let's give it some bait. If in doubt, feed. Again, no particles in the mix, just ground bait. Always remember to use a marker. Position your pole in the right position. You need accuracy. What you're trying to create is a method feeder principle. I want to try and make sure that my hook bait is in the center of that feed every single time. Always use the same spot, the same marker, be accurate. You'll foul up less fish and you'll catch more fish. No signs, that's a good sign. No signs is a good sign. You don't want loads of indications, you just want clean bites. So all of a sudden, my peg's gone from indications of silvers being there. Just had a little sign there, but that was off a carp. You could tell as if the fins caught the line or something. But I'm happy now, I'm settled. I know that there are carp in the area because all of a sudden the silvers have completely vanished. Watch this, I better get a roach after I've said that. No being serious. The peg's calming right down. Time of day, always the same. And even later on in the year when it gets cooler, it's always the same. That was definitely a carp that's just moved my float. So rather than lifting the rig out, I'm just dragging the rig back to the same position without having to lift the hook bait off the bottom. Because like what I said earlier, if I lift that hook bait off the bottom, I could quite easily spook a carp that's in my peg. You can see him now. There's one in my peg. A tail to the right and this is the first time I've seen this today complete silence in the peg which is very good you don't want too many fish in your peg and this is a beauty about this venue in particular they're so clever so cute they don't come into your peg in twos, threes and fours. Sometimes twos, yeah, but often it's just one fish at a time that's coming into your peg and feeding. There we go, just a nice little vortex there, just on the edge of my bait. There's a carp over my bait. But remember, I'm only looking for a proper bite. Like that. It wasn't a fast bite, but it was positive enough 
coming to strike. Again, pull straight back. Angry one. And this is about using the right elastic. It allows you to get in control of that fish before it gets in control of you. Hold him up. What a beautiful fish. And they're what you want. Weight builders like that. Stunning. Right, have we got time? Let's try and get another one. And it's amazing how all of a sudden, like what I've advocated throughout the whole of this session, um, you could be miles behind with an hour to go, but with the right frame of mind, I'm going to change that hook actually. Give me a peg first. With the right frame of mind, you can completely turn around your results in one hour. As long as you've got confidence. And confidence comes from a little bit of knowledge and experience. And I hope this video will give you that confidence to be positive with what you're doing when you're margin fishing. Not just giving it a go for a couple of minutes, chucking it up the bank thinking there's nothing there. Keep feeding it, give them a reason to come down the edge. So, because I'm going to put hook length on and put my hook bait on, I'm going to give them two pots. Isn't it amazing how everything is just transformed because of the time of the day? And this is why. You must never give up. In fact, I'm the other way around, and I think most anglers are that understand this principle. Regardless of the time of the year, they, get, they actually look forward to the closing stages of the match. Because you've spent, let's say there's five minutes left, four hours, 55 minutes, building it up for that crucial five minutes. I can't stress how important it is, but most other anglers lose hope. Once you understand how important those last five minutes are, you know it's going to get you at least one more fish. Or maybe two if you're very lucky. See, there's some fish in my peg now. See a float moving around. But I've got to strike at the right bite. No trying to foul look a fish got to be in the mouth, get it in quicker, get back out and hopefully hook another one before the whistle goes. And I'm convinced that if this peg was a little bit shallower, I'd have hooked one by now because they've got too much choice in what depth they can swim into the peg at. Like that, not a proper bite. And now they're coming in in numbers. Amazing the difference, there you go. Amazing how they're coming in in numbers now. And now they're competing. So what I'm trying to do is I want to keep my pole as low as possible. This is a good fish or feels a better fish. But just keep that pole low really does confuse the fish which direction the pressure is coming from and then once I reach my top kit I'll lower the pole right down and then the fish can just come in so easy he's an angry one but when you know they're in the mouth you can play them with confidence 
Keep the pole low, get everything ready. And there we have it. Well, let me tell you, that's been a really interesting day. And this is what I love about margin fishing. And especially where we've been today, Hawcroft, these big, clever fish, which I've been saying all along are so clever. Seen it all before. And we had to show you, actually the first fish of the day, but in my opinion, the prettiest and the most rewarding. Look at that, absolutely stunning. So I really hope this video is gonna help you Plenty of hints and tips to help you catch loads more fish down the margin, especially when it's targeting these big, beautiful, clever fish. So don't forget to like and subscribe the Match Fishing YouTube channel. And until next time, tight lines.